you very much, um, Dr. McNutt. Um, science in crisis is special. Um, you distinguished actionable, strategic, and irreplaceable uh, types of science, interesting um, examples, and you emphasize the communications uh, opportunities and problems. Um, uh, we have uh, a few minutes uh, after each talk to ask um, specific questions. Um, and the first one comes from uh, academician Wanderlei Bandato. Wanderlei, please uh, ask your question. Can we ask to un... Okay, good. Wanderlei, you have some... Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, much, Marcia, for the wonderful talk. And uh, I am a member of the National Academy of Science. And uh, recently, I, I saw many communications from you about uh, this problem of uh, foreigners uh, collaborating with the United States. So it seems that this pandemic is generating a kind of uh, misunderstanding about scientific collaboration and uh, other issues related to politics. Uh, could you just uh, say a few words in, uh, about this? Yes. So I had another slide in this deck that I took out for time reasons, but it was about COVID-19 as uh, an amplifier of issues that we had before the pandemic that have only been accentuated by COVID. And one of them has been our government's uh, concern about um, foreign influences on science. So even before the COVID pandemic, there were some uh, within our own government, certainly not within the academy, but, but within the government, that there was um, an unfair playing field in terms of our collaborations abroad and um, not, uh, not with our European partners, but with some other partners that um, intellectual property was being shared and it wasn't uh, being shared bilaterally. That the US was sharing its intellectual property, but intellectual property wasn't being shared back to the US. COVID-19 seemed to just pour more fuel on that fire and make it seem even worse. And I think in many other uh, areas, um, we've also seen that COVID-19 has seemed to make matters worse. Uh, I, um, from what I have uh, seen of how the funding agencies have been dealing with this, their general view is that as long as everyone is quite transparent about what their collaborations are, this really should not be a problem. As long as everyone says, these are the people that I'm working with at such and such university overseas, and um, here are um, our arrangements, and they let the government know what they are, um, it's, it's fine. Okay. Uh, colleagues, I have a number of questions. I will take them quickly one after the other and I then ask our speaker, Dr. McNutt, to uh, selectively respond briefly. Um, William Phillips, please. Yes, uh, uh, thanks very much for that, uh, that presentation, Marcia. Uh, as you know, and as others may, may know, <coughs> uh, respected government agencies like the um, Center for Disease Control and uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. are coming under suspicion of having their uh, medical advice and their scientific conclusions uh, become politicized in the present environment. Now, the National Academy of Sciences and the other academies, as well as uh, scientific academies around the world, uh, have at least a history of having a great deal of trust uh, on the part of the, uh, uh, of the public and certainly on the part of the, the scientific community. And what I'm wondering is, do you see a role 
for the academies in um, reviewing or validating the advice that we get from government agencies, for example, as to whether a vaccine that is developed is in fact uh, safe and effective, as one expects for uh, a vaccine that has gone through the traditional uh, vetting process, but that's being accelerated in the, uh, in the present uh, situation. Thank you. Maria Zuber. Hey, thank you. Uh, hi, Marcia. So there's a really simple message that I think just isn't getting the attention that it deserves. And that is, there is really only one path out of this pandemic, and that is science. Nothing else is, is going to get us back to any degree of normality other than science. And this just doesn't seem to get talked about enough. And what can we do about that? Thank you. That's why we are together. Jose Onuchik. Hi, Marcia. Good to see you again. Uh, I have a question about uh, the vaccine effort, if the Academy is involved in anything. For example, there is a big international effort coordinated by the World Health Organization, but many of the developed nations, including the US, decide to go separately instead of join this international effort. So in the spirit of international science, do you want to comment about how the, the Academy has any position on that or, or not? And we have a question from Wolf Singer uh, in the chat space. How do you manage to get Google, etc., in the boat? Uh, back to you, Dr. McNutt. Uh, we will okay. have for cross-cutting discussion later. Okay, well, let me start with uh, Maria's question first. Uh, there is a fabulous ad that's been playing on television that says that the main line is science will get us back to normal. And of course, none of us think that we'll actually ever get back to normal, but, but the main line is a good one. And it talks about all the work that is going into science. And it was actually put out by some um, drug companies. And I think it is a very, very effective ad. And I just wish it would play more, but it's, uh, it's a great one. And there was also the um, story that Seth Bornstein did recently on the Nobels that traced um, the uh, the fact that so much of uh, what's being used right now to, for the pandemic was uh, based on basic science. So I think there are several things that are being done. I agree with you, we need more of it. Um, secondly, about the um, uh, vaccine and the politicalization of um, uh, it and whether there's a role for the academy. Um, let me just say this, um, right now from what I've seen, um, the, uh, those political forces that at one point seem poised to intervene uh, and um, perhaps um, sidestep what would have been uh, the FDA's uh, best process for uh, making sure that um, the vaccine went through all of the hoops that it needs to go through. Um, they have um, stepped back and made sure that the um, FDA gets to um, have its um, a proper process. So I don't see that the Academy feels right now it needs to uh, intervene. I can assure you that if the National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Medicine felt that there was um, the slightest hint that a vaccine was going to be rushed through and approved without appropriate protocols having been followed, we would step in and say something because there is too much on the line. And um, then uh, the question, what was the last question about? Um, uh, Google. Uh, oh, Google. Ah. And, so, and there is another Google-related point in the commentary, questioning it by Salvador Moncada. 
Is it wise to have a partnership with Google in which it is their decision which order the information? Yes. Okay. Um, so, if you may like to pick that up too. Yeah. So um, Google actually approached us um, for this partnership. Uh, and we only agreed um, to do this once we got other internet providers on board as well. So Bing came on as well because we didn't want this to be anything that was proprietary to just one internet provider. We felt that that would be a bad thing. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the um, uh, in terms of the idea that um, that Google would um, prefer uh, would prefer content that comes from trusted sources. When I was director of the USGS, there were some charlatans who were making earthquake predictions based on crazy information, based on basically no evidence whatsoever. And it was causing panics in California. And so um, Google made the choice to prioritize in its web search information from the USGS on earthquakes and earthquake probabilities because it said science should carry the day, not astrology or um, lost cat ads. And so um, that seemed to be a solid decision because whenever the health and safety of lives are on the line, to have science carry the day is a good choice.